First of all, Tony, uh, let me give the full introduction. A guy who one day will be in the Hall of Fame, if I have any say in this, and uh, the former Jags offensive lineman, analyst for Thursday Night Football in Westwood One, joining us on the program. How are you feeling? Good, Dan. Before I talk about this corona, wasn't Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton both better than Michael Jordan yes. in college? Yes. Yeah, okay. I just want to make sure. I thought so, too. Thank you, Tony. Anyways, um, the, uh, I'm doing better every day and uh, getting my strength back. My lungs are still a little bit uh, um, shady in the sense of it uh, can – I don't gas – I'm not gasping for air. I can breathe and everything, but uh, I get tired quickly. So that's probably going to be the last thing that comes back. When did you realize something was wrong? Um, so uh, probably March 17th, you know, the night of the 16th, but really the 17th, I, I, I started getting, uh, like, I felt like a head cold. And I honestly thought it was just some allergies, no big deal. Took my temperature just because of this COVID thing going on, making sure, you know, I didn't have a fever or anything. I didn't. Um, I woke up Wednesday morning and I felt pretty lousy and felt like the flu almost. And I took my temperature, had a fever, and then I started thinking, okay, this is interesting. And about an hour later, I got a phone call from a friend of mine saying, hey, last Thursday, um, we were around somebody who had who has tested positive since. And so I took a test, went to Mayo, my doc at Mayo, took a test and found out the next Friday, I think it was probably like the 18th or whatever, 19th of, of uh, March, that uh, I was positive. And, uh, and, then the, and then the kind of the journey began at that point. What did you do next? You know, I, I, I'll be honest with you, Dan, I didn't think much of it. Um, both my wife and I were positive because we were at the same event. Um, she felt fine. Um, I felt like I had the flu. And I said, you know, I'm 47. You know, I'm healthy. I have no underlying, you know, health conditions. I'll be fine. I figured by Sunday. I'd be up and going. I actually talked to a buddy of mine who had been exposed as well and ended up not having any issues. And I, we said, let's, we'll, by Sunday, we'll be able to, you know, hook up and let's, you know, we'll get together. Uh, just the, one of our houses. And, uh, and by Sunday night, I was, you know, I thought I'd feel a little bit better, but then come uh, about Monday night, Tuesday, the fall, you know, I really started going downhill fast and, and uh, ended up going to the hospital on that Wednesday. When did you realize when you were in the hospital that this is really serious? Not, I don't know if you felt yeah. it was life-threatening, but did you feel like it was? Yeah. Um, and so I woke up that Wednesday morning and knew that something was not right, and the, like it was going bad because I was wheezing and I was having a harder time to catch my breath. And so I called the doc. He said, hey, go to the emergency room. And I'll be honest, when I went to the emergency room, um, I thought I was just going to get some fluids and some medicine, and I'd be back home. In fact, my daughter dropped me off, and I told her, I said, I'll call you to come pick me up when I'm done. And uh, I went in there, and they took x-rays of my chest, and the pulmonologist came in and said, hey, listen, we'll put you in the ICU. And I think at that point, I was like, well, wait, well, wait a second, ICU? Yeah. And I said, I, actually, my response to him says, I don't want to go. And he says, well, you need to be on oxygen. You need to be watched very closely, and we need to get these drugs in you. And that's when it got, you know, real, like this is, you know, this could go either way. And the doctor basically said, like, we don't know where this is going to go. We're going to do our best. It wasn't like, you know, your typical doctor visit where he says, hey, we got this. Everything's going to be fine. You'll be okay. It was, we're going to see where this goes. We're going to give you drugs. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to get you on oxygen. And there were moments in the ICU when I'm laying there and I'm thinking, you know, is this it? You know, is this the way you go? And uh, it was it was uh, some scary moments because you're by yourself. Your family can't come see you. Um, the only people who are allowed in the room are the medical, uh, the healthcare workers who are amazing people that are coming in their all their protective outfits and everything else. But other than that, you're by yourself. So um, th there were some moments where you question, and because you don't know which way it's going to go. Thankfully, day three in the ICU, um, I started heading in the right direction and got better pretty quick from that point on. And that loneliness, that isolation, and this is what I have a person who, uh, a friend who works in ER in a Houston hospital, and they said, you can just see the panic in the patients because they don't know, and we don't know either, and you're just lone. You're you're there with your thoughts there, and that can yeah, be, I, I, you know, that can, you know, it does damage to your psyche because then you're your own worst enemy. Yeah, and I think the two things that you said. One, 
is you're by yourself and your mind starts running. And then two, these healthcare workers are amazing, but they're also honest. I mean, they don't sit there and say everything's fine. I mean, they came in and said, we're going to do everything we can, but we got to see where this goes. We just don't know yet. Yeah. And those things put together are really scary. And, I, and and this is where, you know, I'm thankful for my faith. You know, you really, because you know, I you have no, I didn't know where else to turn. I had nowhere else to turn. And, and you just pray, you hope, you know, the other people out there who love you are praying for you. And, and that's where I tried to focus on because there was moments I could feel my mind starting to run away in the wrong direction. You feel the anxiety come in and, and you just, the way I thought it was knowing that my family was praying for me and that, you know, my faith in God. And, and you just, at that point are believing and hoping for the best. And uh, that's all you can do. He's Tony Baselli, former Jags offensive lineman, five-time pro bowler and lead analyst Thursday night football in Westwood one. And then you start to think not to put thoughts in your mind, but you hear other uh, people who have been in this situation. They say, is this how I'm going to die? Like, am I, am I going to die right here? I'm going to be alone in a bed, and my daughter and my wife are not going to be around. Is this the way I go? No, you're not putting thoughts in my head because that thought went through my head multiple times playing in the ICU, and like you, you, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine it. I'm like, this can't be it. There's no way. Well, plus the football mentality in you is like oh, you fight. You just fight at that point. But were you in denial? At any point where Probably. you go, you know, hey, I'm Tony Baselli. This this doesn't hurt me. No, I wasn't. This doesn't hurt me because it, it it was hurting me, and I was down and out. But I just, I was just, you know, you just at that point, I was really trusting in my faith and in the medical workers, Dan. I'll be honest with you, that these doctors were the best. I mean, I was at a great hospital at Mayo. They were caring for me. The nurses were amazing, and I was just like, this is going to work. And you just have to believe because you, you talk, like because the other thought of it, the other side of that, and I, I thought not to go down that path is I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die here by myself. And the scary, the add to the scariness is you know that there's people down the hall that are dying, yeah, that are in the ICU with you that are dying, and you're laying there and just saying, I got to just keep fighting. I got to keep on believing, and just hope that what the doctors are doing is going to work. I appreciate you telling this story because I'm sure when this first broke and somebody leaked that you had tested positive, you know, there's this invasion of privacy that you feel, but we, we need, unfortunately we need faces and voices and names attached to this just so we get people's attention. But if you were going to do a PSA for this audience, just to, let them know what this is and what to do, what would you say? Yeah, I'd say this is, it's real. This is not, you know, this, people aren't over dramatizing this. This is a real like virus that will mess you up if you get it. Now the odds are that if you're my age or younger or even a little bit older and you're healthy, that yeah, the odds are you're going to be okay. And it'll be a minor cold or flu and you'll never even go to the hospital, but there's a chance you're going to have like me and a chance even, you're going to have worse than me. And if you want to roll those, roll the dice on your own life, that's your business. But now is a time to think about other people because there are the elderly, there's people with underlying medical conditions, compromised immune systems that can't fight this. And we need to be thinking about everybody else right now. And it's difficult because people are losing jobs and that is awful. And that's where we got to listen to these medical uh, healthcare uh, experts and hopefully we can get through this over the next month. We can get to their side and start getting, trying to get back to some normal life activity. But if we don't take this serious, it's not just you you got to worry about. I think we have to worry about our neighbors and the people around us. I think it's really a time we need to think of not just ourselves, but everyone else around us. How's your wife doing? She's great. She's way tougher than I am. She never even got a fever. <laughs> you know, she's, you know, she lost her taste and smell. That was her big thing. And uh, she was tired. And uh, she, you know, she, she looks at me like I'm soft. because She, she just, she, she just looked, she looked at the virus and just said, get out of here. And uh, here I am in the ICU, big tough football player. So uh, but that's, a, that's the crazy thing, Dan. You don't know how it's going to affect you. You know, two people got out at the same place. We were together. Um, one, both 47, both healthy, no issues. She has it mild, 
comes through it, no issues. I'm gasping for air having to go to the ICU. I mean, so you just don't know. And this is why we have to take it really serious, seriously until the healthcare experts start learning more about this and start figuring things out. And I'm worried about, and look, there's other things to worry about, but sports-wise, I'm worried about this draft. It feels like we're trying to shoehorn this into regularly scheduled programming, and let's continue to do this, where I don't know what the world's going to be like or our country is going to be like in seven days or ten days. Should we be holding the draft when we have it scheduled? Yeah, I don't don't have the answer to that, Dan. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I haven't been paying much attention to sports. I'm just trying to get caught up right now. I think overall... I think what the NFL is trying to do is trying to plan for, like, we're going to play football in September. And I understand why, because you, I mean, at some point, I mean, we have to, you, you, I worry about this disease, but I also worry about the people out of work and the people that are trying to, you know, uh, provide for their families. And I think all of us, we don't know what the future holds. And I think trying to keep things as normal as possible yeah. when we do the social distancing, I get that. But also at the same time, I think we have to be flexible because, like you said, it could change quickly. And if it changes quickly and it goes the wrong direction, I think and I hope leadership will make the right decision um, because we just don't know where this thing's going. We don't know what next week's going to be like, and we for sure don't know what it's going to be like in uh, August and September. Once again, thank you for telling your story. I, I'm sure that it probably was difficult in the beginning to share that. But, uh, you know, these are the things that help get people aware and maybe save lives as well. Well, Dan, you're right. And I, I was always, you know, I didn't know when I was going to do this and, and I was feeling so lousy. I wanted to wait. And you mentioned it got leaked and uh, which was, I was really disappointed about because people I love found out about it without me telling them. And that bothered me. But I, uh, after the first time I did an interview, I had, a, I had my doctor at Mayo who's overseeing me and making sure I get back to hundred percent. And she said, Hey, listen, I really want to thank you. And I said, why? And she says, you don't know what it means to us as the healthcare workers, someone telling people, and it's not us telling them, but it's you telling them really how serious this is because we want people to take it serious. And so at that point, I said, you know what? I'll talk as much as I can. Then if it's going to help um, healthcare workers, it's going to help people have awareness. And so we can get to the other side of this. It's a small thing, but it's the least I can try to do. Did you wear your Jags jersey to the hospital? <laughs> Did you look for special don't, treatment, Tony? Don't don't make me laugh because I, I got to start coughing. No, it's hard to. I can't. I can't get my breath. Um, I did not. Okay. I, maybe I should have. Okay. But uh, I'll tell you, the people at Mayo were amazing, and this is what blew me away. I mean, you in the midst of all this stuff that's going on, you're you know, and you, you have conversations with God, like, where are you, and what's going on? I don't get this, and uh, but you see the love of God and people in these healthcare workers. And what they do is amazing, Dan. Yeah. They come in knowing that this is a – watching people die from a virus. And without hesitation, they came in and took care of me and everyone else up there. And this is my only contact to humanity of people. And they were amazing from the doctors, the PAs, the nurses, health techs coming in to take my blood. I mean, they were amazing people. And I cannot say what they mean to me and the courage they show to help me get through this whole thing. Well, it's good to talk to you. And uh, we'll talk football the next time. Let's hope so. Let's hope we get back to some normal activities and we can talk sports here without worrying about this in the near future. Thank you, Tony. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Dan. That's Tony Baselli, former Jags All-Pro.